A rebellious teenager. Running the roads, drinking, doing drugs. A hands-off mother. Shayna kind of had free reign from her mother. And a strict stepfather. He wanted her to have a, a curfew, to have to come home, to have to go to school. It was a recipe for tragedy. I can't tell if he's been shot in the face or somebody hit him with something. And the investigation would send authorities scrambling to answer two questions. Had a rebellious teen gone too far? I heard her say, yeah, I did it for my mom. Or was she acting under parental supervision? Who came up with the idea and the plan? Cushing, Texas, October 23rd, 2005. It was a little after 7 a.m. when the phone rang at Francis and David Bone's house. The caller was their son James's wife, Marseille Kelly, and she needed a favor. James wasn't answering his phone. Marseille called wanting someone to go wake him up because she couldn't get him awake. Marseille was wrapping up her night shift at Lufkin Memorial Hospital, and her truck driver husband, Marseille explained, needed to get an early start on some repairs to his rig. He wanted me to call him at 7 and wake him up uh, so he could work, finish what he was doing to the trucks. David Bone went next door to wake up James. His home was only about 75 or 100 yards away. But James didn't answer the older man's knock. He called Marcy and told her James didn't wake up. And she said, no, he's got to get up. You've got to get him up. So David returned next door. Only this time, he didn't just knock, he went inside. That's when he found James lying in bed. James was eerily still, with a quilt pulled up over his head. He kept calling James and couldn't wake James up. Took his walking stick and poked him on the foot, and he didn't move or anything. So he pulled the quilt back. And that's when David Bone discovered why he couldn't wake James Kelly. 911. This is David Bowman. Okay. He's out What's going on? I think he's dead in the bed. Marseille was only 21 when she met James Kelly. But she'd already been married, divorced, and a mother. I got married the first time at 17. When I met James, I had two children, uh, Shana and Caitlin. She also had a bit of a reputation, a holdover from her years as a rebellious teen. I quit school in the ninth grade, dabble into marijuana a little bit. She got into, you know, different trouble hanging around with, you know, different people, you know, that she shouldn't have been hanging around with. In fact, that's how she met James in 1992. James and Marseille met, I guess you'd call it, with the crowds that run around. They do a lot of street racing during that time, and that's actually how they met. Two years younger than Marseille, James was a classic good old boy. All he wanted to do was go out and have a good time, and it consisted of something that went fast or made lots of noise. And Marseille seemed like the perfect girl for him. He loved the fact that she liked to play, you know, in the, the four-wheel drive trucks. You know, they had a lot in common on that. James and Marseille dated off and on over the next few years. Marseille had a third daughter with another boyfriend, and James had two sons with another woman. Then, two events changed James and Marseille's lives. In 1995, a probation violation put James behind bars. During the time he was in prison, Marseille and James would, you know, cor correspond back and forth. After he got out, he started actually trying to do better. Meanwhile, Marseille was dealing with a tragedy of her own. Her mother and her daughter, Caitlin, died in a house fire. And the disaster almost claimed the life of her eldest daughter as well. Shana attempted to ride her bicycle out in front of an 18-wheeler to go be with her grandma and her sister. The suicide attempt earned six-year-old Shayna a brief stay in a mental hospital. From that age on, Shayna was a child that pushed people away. 
The incident was also a wake-up call for Marseille. She had went back to school. She became a respiratory therapist. Released from prison, James had saved enough money to buy a truck and went into business for himself. He had really seemed to straighten his life out. He was a hard-working individual. And before long, James and Marseille were dating again and trying to build a better life together. Marseille and her daughters moved in with James and his sons, living next door to his mother. I have eight acres, and my mother-in-law had a house. I had a trailer. James had a double wide. And in 2003, more than a decade after their first date, the couple married. She wanted to go just in front of the Justice of the Peace. And James told her no. He would get married in a church. And they did. They got married in a church. And he was happy. He really was. At that day, you would have thought he owned the world. James didn't own the world, but he did own two more trucks. By the wedding, what had started as a one-man operation had grown into a small firm. If you have three trucks and you're working every day, you can make pretty good money. Marseille was making good money too, investing some of her hospital salary in a side business. I had bought some bounce houses and started a part-time rental business that I would do on the weekend. And I continued also to do my work as a therapist and the paperwork for the trucking company. So, I mean, we, we both stayed really busy. But the money they earned did offer ample opportunity to enjoy their time together. We liked to go to uh, this place called Shiloh Ridge. It was a four by four mud park. They would go down there and play in the mud. And from the time he's a little bit, he loved to play in mud. If there was a mud puddle, he's gonna step in. But James and Marseille also had another hobby, fighting. You know, James always thought he was right. And Marseille always thought she was right. Somebody's got to be wrong. Can't be two rights. And, you know, they bickered and argued. There were some times when me and James were arguing or fighting, or mostly we'd been drinking. But after every argument, Marseille and James found a way to make up. He loved her, and he was just kind of there to do whatever she wanted to do. She wanted a car, he bought her a 68 Camaro. She wanted a four-wheeler, he bought a four-wheeler. By 2005, the blue-collar couple was moving into the middle class. But their material possessions, mass tensions threatening to tear the family apart. October 5, 2005, Marseille found herself in the middle of another argument. This time, it wasn't with her husband, but with her 16-year-old daughter, Shayna. I had asked her to clean her room, and she got mad. And we ended up getting in an actual fight, like this fight. The sheriff's department got called out because uh, Shana and Marseille got into it pretty bad. In fact, they were still at it when the deputies arrived. She had pushed me into this, the glass screen door, and um, I had a spot on my head that was bleeding. Shana was arrested on that, and as a result, was placed on juvenile probation. Shayna's arrest was the culmination of a battle that had been brewing since Marseille's marriage to James when Shayna was just 13. No stepfather is going to come on the scene at that kind of age and be able to take over a successful parenting role even under the best circumstances. Shayna's circumstances were far from best. Not only had she been struggling with the trauma of her grandmother and sister's untimely deaths, she'd inherited all her mother's teenage rebelliousness. Shana was pretty wild, uh, running the roads, uh, drinking, doing drugs. She was a troubled child. She had been spinning out of control for a while. Not that her mother had tried to control her. Marseille really allowed Shana a lot of privileges that uh, most children would not be accustomed to and probably should not be allowed. I felt like if I gave them what they wanted or let them do what they wanted, it was kind of to make up for me not being there. Shayna had begun skipping school on a regular basis. And much like her mother before her, she'd fallen in with a tough crowd. Shayna was hanging out with people who had been involved in the juvenile system as well as the adult criminal justice system. It was a world her stepfather knew well, a world he'd been determined to keep his stepdaughter away from. James was always trying to correct Shayna. 
more or less be a father figure to her. She didn't want that. And she would tell him, you're not my father. The friction between James and Shayna had led to arguments between James and Marseille. We had different ways of uh, raising the kids. Uh, that was most of our arguments and fights. Anytime I would be around, it was a problem. It's like he developed an attitude anytime I came around and you could feel when somebody doesn't want you around. So Shayna made an effort not to be around at all. I felt like that I was the cause of their problems. So when I got old enough and I got a boyfriend, I moved out. It seems like their relationship was better when I was gone. She did move out with her boyfriend. She was almost 15, but she was still 14. Marseille had done little, if anything, to stop her. For Marseille to have allowed her 14-year-old daughter at that time to move out of the residence and go live with a boyfriend just kind of shows that it was a relationship that she and her mother shared that would not be typical. A few weeks later, Shayna was back home. And by 2005, James's tougher parenting approach appeared to be rubbing off on Marseille. When Shayna moved out again at 16, Marseille had taken action. So I went and got her things and made her move home. Within days, mother and daughter had come to blows. If James and Marseille hoped the arrest would turn Shayna around, they were sadly mistaken. If anything, she became wilder, taking up with a new 23-year-old boyfriend named Dallas Christian. Dallas Christian was a registered sex offender, not somebody that ideally one would think you would want your daughter associating with. Marseille apparently didn't object, but James Kelly certainly did, though arguing with Marseille did no good. I think he was to the point to where he was tired of all the arguing and everything. By October, with James's patience wearing thin, the fights with stepdaughter Shayna took on a new threatening tone. She'd tell him, I'm gonna kill you one of these days. Saturday, October 22nd, 2005 was technically a day off for James Kelly. But there was little downtime for a small businessman with a fleet of hardworking trucks. He was doing some uh, maintenance repairs on them, brakes and oil changes and stuff. By six, when Marseille was starting her overnight shift at Lufkin Memorial, James was already up to his elbows in engine oil, and he would stay at it for hours. I talked to James a couple of times early in the night. He was still working on his truck. At least he could work in peace. Shayna had disappeared with her new boyfriend, Dallas Christian, and a younger boy by the name of Colton Weir. Shayna, Colton, Dallas were out riding partying, drinking. Finally, at a little past 3 a.m., James Kelly could do no more. He was ready to take a shower and get ready for bed. But as exhausted as James was, the work wasn't finished. He called his wife, Marseille, at the hospital asking for a wake-up call, that he needed to wake up early on Sunday and get back to work. That wasn't anything unusual when he stayed up late. His wake-up call arranged James had laid down for a few hours sleep. James went to bed around 3.30 in the morning, and uh, he expected to be awakened about four hours later. But James would not be answering his wake-up call. She started trying to call him, and he didn't answer the phone. But he didn't answer because he was dead. That's the reason. Coming up, Marseille receives the awful news. Okay, hang, hang that, hang that. Stop. Stop taking And the investigators wonder, was someone in the family running with a deadly crowd? Sunday, October 23rd, 2005. It was about 8 a.m. when Marseille Kelly's father-in-law, David Bone, dialed 911 and reached the Nacogdoches County Sheriff's Department. The call reported that... Uh something was wrong with James Kelly, uh, that there was obvious signs of blood, uh, they needed an ambulance. I can't tell if he's been shot in the face or somebody hit him with something in the face, but it's all bloody as hell. Bone had gone to wake his stepson a few minutes earlier at Marseille's request. She'd been trying to call James for almost half an hour, and he wasn't answering the phone. I couldn't get him up, so I called and I asked his stepfather if he would go and wake him up. 
But James Kelly couldn't wake up. When Mr. Bone went inside the bedroom, he pulled the covers back from James's head and immediately saw that James was dead. With sheriff's deputies on the way, David Bone called his daughter-in-law back. My husband called Marseille Dayton and uh, told her that she needed to come home, that something bad had been happened to her. He said he's got some blood on his mouth. Um, he said, I called the ambulance. I said, OK, I'm leaving work. Although she was apparently too shaken by the news to drive. I called James's best friend, and I told him something was wrong with James, and I wanted to know if he could drive me out there. I jump in the car, and we're making a mad dash for James and Marseille's house. While Marseille and Kevin Dill sped toward the Kelly's house, deputies were arriving on the scene. They found James's mother, stepfather, and a growing number of neighbors gathered in the yard. It doesn't take uh, word long to spread in a small community, so other people uh, that knew the, the Kelly family also began arriving. They had little information to offer the investigators, however. Everyone present was upset. They, they knew that something tragic and terrible had happened to James. Uh, they weren't exactly sure at that point what had happened. When the deputies went inside, they found James exactly as David Bone had described in his 911 call. It was dark. He was laying in the bed, had the covers up to him. In his call, David Bone had been unsure whether his stepson had been beaten or shot. For law enforcement officers, there was no mistaking the grisly wound that had left James Kelly covered in blood. Kelly had been shot in the face. We had a homicide on our hands. Was it an intruder? To police, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. It did not appear that anything else had really been disturbed. But lying on the floor near James's bed, the deputies did find one puzzling clue. There was a telephone, a cellular phone laying in the bedroom uh, on the floor that uh, was still open, still in a call type state. Had James been shot in his sleep or had he been trying to make a call when the killer struck? While the officers pondered the mystery, Marseille and James's friend Kevin picked up an impromptu police escort as they sped to the scene. We get pulled over by the law. Of course, we're going too fast. The car had barely stopped before Marseille leaped out to try and explain the situation. Okay, hang that, hang that, hang that. Stop. Stop taking breath. When you look at the video, you see that Marseille is very distraught. What's the deal? I don't know. My father in law found my husband and they just took out and got there. They said he's dead. Marseille was in such obvious distress that the officer let them go with a warning. I'm sorry for you lost. By the time she'd reached home a few minutes later, however, it appeared that Marseille had pulled herself together. When we pulled up in the yard, she calmly got out of the car, walked over there, talked to an officer for a second. Marseille walked up on the porch and Bell Ball was coming out the door. And she looked at him and said, is he dead? And Bill said, yes. Confirmation of the horrible news seemed to send Marseille into shock. She just turned, walked in the house, got the dog food, went and fed the dogs. She was flat. She had no emotions, no, no nothing. So I asked, could I feed the dogs? Because I wanted in the house. I, I just wanted in, you know, to see. The officers at the scene did have some questions for her, however. While the coroner's personnel removed James's body from the bedroom, Marseille sat in the living room and gave the investigators a brief statement. We asked her some questions about uh, the last time she had spoken to James. Marseille told the deputies she'd last talked to James while at work at around 3.30 a.m. when he'd requested the wake-up call. And then they asked me, do you know anybody that wanted him dead? I said no. Uh, that's, did he have any enemies? Uh, I said, well, I mean, there's people that don't like, like him, but I wouldn't say enough to kill him. That's what Marseille said in the living room. But out in the yard, 
Deputies were getting a different story from family members. Shana's name came up several times. The family, as well as law enforcement, was familiar with the troubled relationship that Shana had uh, with James. Not only had Shana frequently sparred with her stepfather, several of the young men she ran with had police records. Dallas Christian's name, Colton Weir's name, uh, they all emerged very early on. And we in law enforcement here were familiar with some of those names from some prior dealings as well. And as the deputies at the scene couldn't help but notice, Shana and her friends were conspicuously absent from the growing crowd in the yard. We wanted to talk to Shana, so we began to ask uh, Marseille and, and family members where we could find her at. Marseille played a part in helping us track them down uh, by calling them. Shana and Dallas Christian came in together that evening. Questioned by the investigators, Shana said she'd last seen James Kelly at around 9 p.m. the night before. I went home last night about 9 o'clock and got my clothes. I sat down with my dad and we talked for a little while and I asked him, can I go stay at a friend's house because I'm on probation? Mm -hmm. And he said yes. For once, according to what she told the detectives, there had been little drama between Shana and her stepfather. Nobody argued, we didn't fight, you know, we just, we just talked. Asked what she'd done Saturday night, Shana said she and the boys had spent most of the evening driving around the back roads and partying down by the river. They were out at the Shawnee River bottom drinking that night. It's not uncommon for teenagers to gather up down there, build bonfires and, and have a party. And apparently that's what they had done on this particular occasion. In the next interrogation room, deputies got a similar story from Dallas Christian and from 15-year-old Colton Weir when he was questioned the next day. We went down in Shawnee and chilled out down there and watched the fire, you know. You know, shot a couple of guns off. All three stories more or less matched, but not details and inconsistencies in their stories began to emerge and we could then uh, question them more specifically. And the investigators knew exactly where to apply the pressure. The youngest member of the trio, 15-year-old Colton Weir. Colton, I believe you're a smart enough kid to know what you're in here for. And I believe that you need to get it off your chest. I believe it's eating you alive and you need to talk to me about it. Coming up, Deputies press Colton Weir for a confession. Did you shoot James Kelly? And his answer takes the investigators in a startling new direction. She offered him uh, remuneration. On the evening of October 23, 2005, James Kelly had been dead less than 24 hours. But the Nacogdoches County Sheriff's Department already had several strong suspects in his murder. Kelly's stepdaughter, Shana Sapovado, her boyfriend, Dallas Christian, and their friend, Colton Weir. These kids had been into some trouble. Uh, we had dealt with them. 16-year-old Shana also had a history of fighting with her stepfather, something her mother, James's wife, Marseille, hadn't mentioned to the investigators. Now, I had my suspicions, um, but no, I didn't say anything because first of all, I hadn't talked to my daughter. And why didn't she mention her daughter's James? According to Marseille, it was because she hadn't taken them seriously. It's a teenager ranting and raving. So that's the way I took it. I mean, I never believed there was any truth in it. Questioned that evening, Shana and her boyfriend had both denied killing James Kelly. But when the investigators spoke to 15-year-old Colton Weir, the young man who'd been riding around with Shana and Dallas that Saturday night, it was quickly apparent that the teenager knew something. I have to look in your face and I can tell that you need to get it off your chest. I mean, it, it, it's eating you alive. I can see it in your face. By the time we were able to more or less confront him, Colton had had a little bit of time to reflect on the gravity of what he had done. Investigators were quick to capitalize on Colton's guilty conscience. Did you shoot James Kelly? On the verge of tears, the teenager could only nod. 
Colton Weir confessed to them that he had been the person that pulled the trigger. After you shot, what did you do? Ran as fast as I could because I was scared. Then the teen went on to reveal what he said were the full details of James Kelly's death. The kids had gone out partying. They were all together. Uh, they had already discussed and planned the fact that this murder was going to occur. And they were just kind of looking for the right opportunity. According to Colton, the opportunity had come early on the morning of October 23rd. That's when Colton claimed that he, Shana, and Dallas had driven out to the house where James Kelly slept. Shana and Colton got out of the car, got a gun and some gloves out of the trunk of the car. They went to the house where Shana let Colton in the house, showed Colton where James's room was. Shana comes back. I think she gets sick to her stomach. She comes back, gets in the car. Meanwhile, Colton had snuck into the bedroom. Where was James at when he went in the house? In his bed. He gets right up in front of James Kelly, who is asleep, and he pulls the trigger. Then, according to Colton, the trio had gone back down to the riverbank. They threw the gun into the river, and they burned a few items, some gloves, a sweater that somebody had been wearing. A confession, a list of accomplices, the location of the murder weapon. By the time Colton finished, only one question remained. Why would he go along with the plot? She offered him uh, remuneration, like uh, she referred to it as a ride, meaning a vehicle of some kind. Only according to Colton, it wasn't Shana who'd offered. By who? By Marcia. It was a stunning statement. But was it true? Was Marseille behind her husband's murder? When the investigators confronted Shayna with the news of Colton's confession, she denied everything. Shayna didn't say anything that helped the investigators. Dallas Christian, on the other hand. If you had to say, here's, here's who came up with the idea and the plan, who's most responsible? Shayna and Marseille. Shannon Marcy Cole. Yes, sir. Marcy Kelly's name continued to emerge by the other co-defendants in the case as having been involved in the planning and the encouraging of this act, uh, even to the point of offering them money and vehicles and things of that nature if they would carry the act out. Dallas even told the officers how after the shooting, Shana had called her mother and told her James was dead. Job's done. That's what Shannon said. They're the job's By Tuesday evening, two days after James's murder, Colton, Shana, and Dallas were all in custody. But a warrant for Marseille's arrest would have to wait. The investigators needed evidence to confirm that Marseille was the mastermind behind her husband's murder. We had to establish a more affirmative link than uh, just their word. So when Marseille turned up at the sheriff's department on Tuesday, it was merely to provide moral support to her daughter. And as the teenager was booked on murder charges, she finally broke down. In the office with one of the deputies, I heard her saying, you know, yeah, I did it for my mom. Um, I, I didn't want him making her cry anymore. Shayna may have stopped all the fighting in the Kelly household, but did she act alone? Or was her mother involved? That was the question sheriff's deputies had to answer. We needed to look at her or continue to look at her as a potential suspect. But to the rest of the world, Marseille was a grieving widow, busy with arrangements for her husband's funeral. Meanwhile, the investigators were equally busy looking for evidence to confirm Dallas and Colton's statements. They searched the place where Colton claimed they tossed the murder weapon. We did recover the rifle out of the river and also the scene where they burnt the sweater and the gloves. There were still remnants there from where they did that. We were very pleased to have that physical evidence. But while the gun appeared to confirm Colton's account of the shooting, it didn't necessarily incriminate Marseille. There was something that could, however, 
In his interrogation, Dallas Christian claimed that Shayna had called her mother and informed her that the job was done. Cellular phone records played a very vital part in us being able to link Marseille. When the investigators subpoenaed Marseille and Shayna's phone records, they revealed a series of calls between mother and daughter over the course of the night. Marseille's phone calls to Shayna before James was shot and after James was shot very much put her in the role of at least being a participant. The phone records also confirmed that Marseille and James had spoken several times over the course of the evening. But instead of arranging a wake-up call, authorities were beginning to suspect that James Kelly had unwittingly signed his death warrant. Those phone calls were her attempts to try and determine about what time uh, James was planning on going to bed and that it was okay to go up there and carry this act out. And then there was the mysterious matter of the open cell phone deputies had found lying by the bed. The last call made from that phone had been to Marseille Kelly. The fact that the phone was found open and that the last call had been made well after James supposedly turned in raised an intriguing possibility. We really believe that Marseille had staged this to be able to hear the gunshot uh, as this act actually took place. On the afternoon of Wednesday, October 26th, Marseille Kelly met with her late husband's family at a local funeral home. We had a private viewing where we could open the casket. Midway through the viewing, Marseille got a phone call. That was the deputy. He said, come down here something anyway. They had a few more questions for me. Marseille arrived at the station annoyed. James's funeral was just hours away. I asked him if we're going to be done in time for me to make it to the services that night. The answer was no. So I, this may come as a shock to you, but we have a warrant for your arrest. And now I ask him for what, and he says murder. The deputy was right. The news did appear to shock Marseille. She acted dumb, like she didn't know what we were talking about, and I uh, just can't believe this. I said, you know, why? And he says that I hired Colton. I thought it was just a mistake because I knew I'd never uh, talked to Colton. I've never asked Colton to kill my husband. Coming up, Marseille's case goes to court and Shayna takes the stand. It was heartbreaking. August 1st, 2006. It was less than a year since Marseille Kelly's husband, James, had been found dead, shot to death in his sleep. Marseille's 17-year-old daughter, Shayna, had immediately been suspected of the crime. Shayna's name certainly came up early on. Shayna was on juvenile probation at that particular time for assaulting Marseille. But once Shayna, her boyfriend Dallas Christian, and friend Colton Weir were in custody, things had only gotten more intriguing. The case took a huge turn from being a case of an upset stepdaughter and her friends killing a man to his own wife being implicated in a murder for hire scheme. They began to immediately explain to us that Marseille had actually offered them payment uh, for having her husband killed. And when Marseille walked into an East Texas courtroom that morning to stand trial for her husband's murder, she faced the possibility of life in prison. After a great deal of talk with James's family, I just didn't believe a jury would send Marseille to um, the death chamber for this offense. So I elected not to seek the death penalty. But why would Marseille want James dead? When she presented her opening statement that morning, Prosecutor Stephanie Stevens said the motive was simple, money. Not only would Marseille get the assets of James's trucking business, there was also his life insurance, money that Marseille was very keen on collecting, according to the prosecutors. The funeral home director did actually contact us and advise us that they thought it was a little strange that she had asked about collecting on those payments. And prosecutors claimed Marseille had earmarked a portion of that money 
to pay Colton Weir for the hit. Marseille, through Shana, had promised him a truck in exchange, a truck and I believe some money in exchange for doing this. There was also mention of a uh, jet ski, you know, stuff that he never had, probably didn't think he'd ever would have. So he, he fell for it. In its open, the defense didn't deny that Marseille had talked about killing James. But in their version, it wasn't part of any elaborate plot. I did a few times say that I wanted James dead, but people say that every day. I mean, everybody says that sometimes when they're, you know, God, I just want to kill you, or, but not in the same context as it was made out to be. Marseille tries to minimize her involvement by saying, oh, I thought everybody knew I didn't really mean it. Was it solicitation? or was Marseille simply venting? When the prosecution started presenting its case that afternoon, they argued that Marseille had done far more than occasionally wish James dead. It wasn't something that happened, you know, one night at a party she had too much to drink. It happened at different times, um, at different locations. And prosecutors had a pair of witnesses to back up the claim. And they weren't Dallas Christian and Colton Weir, the two young men who'd already implicated Marseille. She had discussed killing James with not just Colton Weir, but with a few people. We were actually able to establish two different individuals that Marseille had approached in the past and offered the payment of money or vehicles to have her husband killed. On August 3rd, the prosecution rested, certain they'd prove that Marseille was behind James's murder. You don't go out and initiate contact with three, four, however many different young men promising them something to kill your husband unless you're serious about it. When the defense started presenting its case that same afternoon, they maintained that Marseille never intended to have James killed. Instead, they claimed that Shayna, Colton, and Dallas had acted on their own. Her own daughter and two other teenagers, she threw all three of them under the bus. Well, I think they were just talking about things that were going on, and just it just happened. Um, I don't think they went out that night planning to do that. I mean, I, I really don't believe that. Marseille stopped short of taking the stand and accusing her own daughter of murder, however. In fact, she didn't testify at all. Instead, it was her 17-year-old daughter who took the stand on August 4th. Shana elected to testify on her mother's behalf at, at Marseille's trial. When she came in and she still had her cuffs on, it was, it was heartbreaking. I mean, I hadn't seen her like that. Despite the fact that her own murder trial was still pending, Shana made an emotional confession on the stand. We left the house, and after I heard the gunshot, nobody said nothing in the car. I had went back to the car. Nobody had said nothing. And then just out of the blue, Colton says that he killed him. He goes, I killed a man. Well, I freaked out and I started screaming because I couldn't believe that it actually, that anything happened like that. According to Shayna, there was no plan and no possibility that her mother could have been involved. My mom was at work and stuff. I mean, there was she didn't have nothing to do with this. And the DA was steady saying, she paid this kid, she paid this kids. She didn't. I made all fingers point to me and my friends. Mainly all fingers point to me. Shayna kind of threw herself under the bus there for her mother and said, I'll take the blame for all of this. You know, Marseille didn't do it for her. She certainly wasn't trying to save Shayna from any sort of blame or keep from implicating Shayna in anything. If what Shayna said was true, her tearful testimony absolved Marseille of all guilt, at least the criminal kind. The only way I blame myself is I put her in that environment. August 4th, 2006. It took the jury just two hours to reach a verdict in the murder trial of Marseille Kelly. The 35-year-old was accused of conspiring with her daughter, Shayna. Shayna's boyfriend, Dallas Christian, and another young man named Colton Weir to kill her husband, James. If convicted, she faced life in prison. Once somebody's convicted of capital murder, the sentence is automatic. But that was only if convicted. Just hours before the jury returned to consider a verdict, 
Marseille's daughter Shayna had made a stunning confession. On the witness stand, the teenager had taken full responsibility for her stepfather's death. I feel like my mom didn't love me because of her husband. And I feel like I had to fight for that love. She wanted her mother's approval. She wanted it so much that she was willing to kill James Kelly. And then even after killing him, she was willing to, to put herself out there to save her mom. When Shana testified at my trial, um, it was really heartbreaking to see her up there uh, defending me. But would Shana's courtroom confession sway the jury? The answer was no. The jury found Marseille guilty of murder. Although Marseille didn't actually pull the trigger, she definitely encouraged, aided, solicited Colton to pull the trigger. And according to the investigators and prosecutors on the case, Marseille is exactly where she belongs. She used her child. She used her child's friends and other people to get what she wanted. She's ruined more than just her husband's life. She's ruined the lives of everybody's family that was involved in this thing. Shayna disagrees. Convicted of murder in 2007 and also serving life in a prison just a few miles away from Marseille, she continues to stand by her mother. I don't think my mom should be in prison. There's no reason for her to be here. Marseille, now serving life without parole, maintains she did not murder James, but she does accept some share of the responsibility. 25%, and that's because I had, you know, we were all there. Um, as far as the, the actual murder itself, I don't feel responsible for. Well, I just hope that one day this will be straightened out. There was no capital murder. There was a murder, but there was no capital murder.